Tomorrow, Facebook will continue its congressional testimony and appear before the Senate Intelligence Committee to discuss the company's ad platform, the mostly automated behemoth that's brought Facebook more than $44 billion in revenue over the past two years, and that a pro-Kremlin troll farm exploited to purchase hate and lie-filled ads during the 2016 election. The idea that you know, fake news on Facebook influenced the, the election in any way, I think, is a, a pretty crazy idea. Initially, Zuckerberg and Facebook were dismissive that fake news and unregulated ads played any role in the 2016 election. But over time, their tone has changed. Things happened on our platform in this election that should not have happened, especially and very troubling foreign interference in a democratic election. I care deeply about the democratic process and protecting its integrity. Facebook's mission is all about giving people a voice and bringing people closer together. The Senate is focusing on Facebook's role in the election. But several people inside the company told Vice News they're concerned that the inquiry will dredge up something much deeper. A decade-long pattern of reckless product rollouts, embarrassing exposures, and denials that put profit first and Facebook's two billion users last. In 2007, Facebook released an ad product called Beacon. It would track you effectively on other websites that had partnered with Facebook. It would send information about your actions on these sites to Facebook, and then Facebook would post something to your feed about what you had been doing. When Beacon began, that process would happen automatically and not require users' consent. Users who bought movie tickets on Fandango would have the movie they saw posted to their timeline. One user had his surprise Christmas gift ruined when the ring he bought on Overstock.com was posted to his timeline and his wife saw it. There was an almost immediate backlash against Beacon, which prompted Facebook to assure users that they could opt out. Except as Stefan Berteau discovered, I was recording the network traffic that was going back and forth between my computer and these websites and Facebook. And I was a little bit concerned to find out that detailed information about my Facebook username, my email address, and the, exactly the, the actions I was taking on these websites was being sent to Facebook. They explicitly claimed that they were not doing that, uh, which constitutes a lie to their user base, for which they later had to apologize. In 2009, Facebook agreed to pay $9.5 million to settle a class action suit brought by users. Beacon was the first sign that inside Facebook, user privacy was not a priority, even to those whose job it was to protect it. Unlike most of the other corporate privacy teams I had spoken to, they seemed very focused on how they could get us to stop calling them a threat perhaps a bit more than how they might actually protect people's privacy. Two years after Beacon, Facebook announced a change to its privacy policy. Suddenly, a user's friends, gender, current city, and even profile photos became publicly available by default. This, to us, felt very much like a bait and switch. Mark Rotenberg leads the Electronic Privacy Information Center, or EPIC. Alarmed by the sudden privacy change, Epic filed a 29-page complaint with the FTC. What we uncovered was the effort of Facebook to change those privacy settings to make user information uh, more widely available than they had intended. Doing a privacy change for 350 million users yeah. is, is a really, you know, it's, it's not, a, it's not the type of thing yeah. that a lot of companies would do, you know, but, but I think that's just, we view that as a really important thing. But criticism over Facebook's ever-changing privacy okay. settings grew. Facebook's recent changes to its privacy policy run a serious risk of taking control of one's personal information away from the user. And the whole tenet of Facebook has been that you control your information. The FTC eventually sided with Epic, creating a consent order that required Facebook to get users' express consent before sharing their personal information. But Rotenberg says the FTC never enforced the order. It sends a message to the companies that even the regulators, even the consumer protection agencies, aren't going to act to protect the interests of consumers. And that can't be right. In 2011, Facebook released tag suggestions. The facial recognition software allowed Facebook to tag users in shared photos automatically. Users were opted in by default. 
How can your users make an informed decision if you don't actually tell them in their privacy settings that you're using facial recognition? This is a 2012 hearing on Facebook's use of facial recognition. And, uh, nowhere does it talk about facial recognition. Okay, that page, right? Um, I, I, I haven't done I haven't done that, so I don't know that, that you haven't done that. So I mean, I, I've done that. I had, I didn't create the the visual, so I I don't know that. But I I can tell you that. What what haven't you done? I'm so curious. so I'm sorry. I I just haven't seen the visual. So. Senator Franken tasked us with researching how private companies were using face recognition technology. Alvaro Bedoya was chief counsel for Minnesota Senator Al Franken. We realized that Facebook had created the world's largest commercial face recognition database without their permission. You can clear your browsing history, you can delete your cookies, and you can turn off your smartphone. You cannot delete your face. Facebook is not collecting this information for benign purposes. Their goal is to be able to track everything we do, not just in our online world, but in person as well. Jay Edelson is leading a class action against the company in the United States, alleging Facebook violated Illinois' Biometric Information Privacy Act when it scanned users' pictures to create face templates without telling them. Facebook has filed a motion to dismiss the litigation, Illinois has the best law in the country when it comes to biometrics. It's a very simple law to uh, comply with. According to court filings, internal Facebook documents appear to show that Zuckerberg was frustrated with product delays and that, quote, we didn't identify privacy questions earlier. Once they realized that they weren't going to get out of the suit quickly, um, they hired uh, a bunch of lobbyists to come in and amend the bill, which would basically gut it. I think their goal was to not just gut it for the future, but to gut it retroactively, which would end up killing our lawsuit. If Facebook succeeds in gutting our nation's strongest biometric privacy law, they're gonna open up a Pandora's box of privacy violations. It's that Illinois privacy law that keeps strangers from pointing a camera at you and using face recognition to identify you by name. Facebook declined to comment on this piece, but last Friday it announced plans to change the way it deals with political ads. Political advertisers will now have to verify their identity, and Facebook is building machine learning to help identify those who don't. This isn't a new process for Facebook. Facebook can regulate ads on its platform, and it does do so every day. Alcohol ads are heavily regulated in every country in the world. Facebook programmatically, by, by which I mean using code, goes through all of its ads, figures out which are probably for alcohol-related stuff, and then apply a set of rules that are particular to that country or you know that particular part of the market. And in a very similar way, they could do the same thing in the political sphere if, if they wanted to. Facebook has also promised to hire 250 additional employees to help, something it has previously been hesitant to do. When I ran the team, believe it or not, at the end of every quarter, the key graph that I had to show Cheryl was the number of ads being policed effectively, going up and to the right, right? We're, we're reviewing more and more ads, and the number of people employed in the team being flat. In other words, we're handling more capacity with the same number of people or fewer. So far, U.S. regulators have lagged behind their European counterparts in reining in tech companies. It's unclear if these hearings represent a new tack or the return of a familiar pattern. The moment you lift a finger to regulate a company like Facebook on Capitol Hill, you will be met by an army of lobbyists. And lobbying will continue to stop these efforts unless we as a whole decide to regulate these companies in a meaningful, common sense way. If I want to look you up or get information about you, I just go to the Facebook and type in your name and it brings me up like, hopefully all the information I'd care to know about you. Facebook began by giving away its product and preaching the gospel of sharing. 13 years later, it's one of the world's most profitable companies, with unprecedented powers of surveillance over its 2 billion users. That means that, at least for now, Facebook knows a lot more about the members of Congress who might regulate it than the members of Congress know about Facebook.